If you haven't attended one of our events before, the Whistler Institute is a registered charity dedicated to influencing change and inspiring minds through education and thought leadership. Part of our annual programming is to host thought-provoking Global Perspective Speaker Series. This is the final event of our 2023-2024 season. Thank you for joining us. I would also like to thank our event sponsors, the Whistler Healthcare Foundation, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, and Hilton Whistler Resort and Spa. Their support enables the Whistler Institute to continue to provide access to educational and thought-provoking content such as this very event. Uh, after the panelists speak, we will be moving to a Q&A format. We won't be using Slido. We'll be having uh, microphones um, on the stairs. So just raise your hand if you have any questions at that point. This event is being recorded, and the video will be added to the Whistler Institute website for further viewing pleasure. Uh, now I would like to introduce our facilitator for the panel discussion, Mike Vanderloos. Mike is Emeritus of Faculty of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UBC. His research has been in rehabilitation robotics, and he has taught engineering design at Stanford and UBC for many years. He is currently enjoying retired life here in town and has been on the Whistler Institute board for the past three years. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mindy. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, so as Mandy said, this, the Whistler Institute is really about opening up discussions with you uh, about uh, topics of global importance, but that have a very local relevance and, uh, as seen from the audience here. A lot of you are, have been touched by concussion or know about it or are in fact uh, caretakers or health providers in that area. So as you can see, um, it's all about concussion, but what we want to do is to focus on prevention, identification, and treatment. So best practices, a bit of technology, a bit of the biomechanics, and um, so hope that hopefully this, this knowledge that we bring here today will be able to open your minds a bit and have you also participate in the discussion afterwards. Um, the event will focus on uh, concussion sports and traumatic brain injury, including biomechanics, neuroscience, prevention, therapy, and recovering. The audience members can expect to learn about the changes that take place in the brain when a concussion occurs, the long-term impacts of concussion, prevention, as well as the rapidly evolving science of concussion, re recognition, treatment, recovery, medical policy, and practice. Policy is also important because it's what governs our, our healthcare system. So the, um, let me move on here a bit. So the, um, what I wanted just to, to say is that, you know, con con uh, it's likely that concussions have touched all of you, either directly or indirectly, in different ways and from different causes. It may have been the result of a fall or a ski accident related to team sports or been from a workplace accident. If the skull hits another hard object, that head impact can cause severe disruption of brain function. In other words, traumatic brain injury or called uh, TBI or commonly called a concussion. So tonight we've brought together four professionals, three academics from the biomechanical and clinical domains and one professional from football, from the CFL. And each of our panelists has a different perspective and expertise base on concussion. So let me introduce the four of them to you. So the first speaker, uh, if you could advance the slide, is Shay Emery. He is a former professional player, uh, was a former professional player in the Canadian Football League. As you'll hear from him, concussions have plagued him and many of his teammates and of course his opponents. He will tell you about his experiences and the recovery process he went through. What I find very motivating is that he has used his experience to teach others on how to positively approach severe medical conditions like recovering from TBI. Oh yeah, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> his um, TEDx talk, if you, uh, it's easy to find, is well worth watching in fact. Next slide. Dr. Lindia Wu is a UBC assistant professor in mechanical engineering. 
She specializes in inventing new ways to use video footage and novel head motion sensors worn by athletes playing sports such as soccer, hockey, and rugby, and then analyzing what actually happens mechanically to the skull and the brain in an impact. After concussive events, cognitive testing can show correlations between the mechanics of the impact and the brain function deficits that result. This is expected to lead to better equipment, better sports rules, and also a better understanding of what the root cause of the brain function disruption actually is. Next slide, please. Dr. Nazan Virjibabal is a UBC physiotherapist and neuroscientist specializing in understanding and treating traumatic brain injury with a special focus on the pediatric population, which runs, as you may know, until about age 18. She'll provide insight into the recent advances in post-TBI therapy and in our understanding of the ne neurological and cognitive changes that occur uh, with concussion. Next slide. Dr. Shalina Babel is a UBC clinical professor in pediatrics, also specializing in TBI, but with a focus on developing strategies that will improve diagnosis, management, and treatment. She developed the Concussion Awareness Training Tool, the CATT, and she will tell you more about that, which has been adopted over the past decade by numerous clinics and educational institutions worldwide. So it really made a big difference. And she will explain uh, the modern regulatory and best practices frameworks for concussion care. And there's a lot more on the bios of our four panelists on the Whistler Institute website in case you're, more, if you're interested in that. So now that I've given you a snapshot of who our panelists um, are, here's the, um, how the evening will unfold. I'll invite each of them to make a short statement on their contributions to our understanding of concussion care and recovery. And I'll then lead the panel in a discussion of topics and questions that have been proposed ahead of time by the panelists to stimulate um, dialogue between them. And then in the final half hour or so, we'll open the floor up for questions that you may have, either for individual panelists or for the panelists as a whole. So um, with that, um, Shay, will you start us off? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. These two, my kids, are waving at me. That's why I was smiling earlier. So you can say hi to them. Wow. Uh, I haven't actually spoken about concussions in a long time. It's something that I've actually steered clear of because when you get paid to hit people with your head for a living and then that living is taken away from you, you really try and find a new way to have a relationship with, one, your physicality, and two, uh, the sport that you grew up that gave you so much, that created a foundation for who you are and how you became the man that you are today. So, do I have to do this myself to... That's not me, there we go, there we go. Pretty good looking guy, eh? Um, gotta start with comedy always, but uh, I'm just gonna tell you my story in a few short words. And as I already mentioned, hitting people with my head for a living was what I looked forward to as a kid. My first time ever playing college football in the NCAA, I showed up, I was 240 pounds, and I was supposed to be playing quarterback. Do you know any 240 pound quarterbacks out there? No, you don't, because they usually get turned over to the other side of the ball. Um, and what I learned was that I was gonna be playing the number five team in the nation. I looked up all the stats of the guys that I'd be going up against, the guys that were going, you know, Heisman, NFL, and I just realized that I needed to work harder. I needed to figure out a way to keep myself safe. And so when I showed up to training camp that day, uh, the, the first day of training camp that year, my first instruction was to take this part of my helmet and put it into the, this part of their helmet. And so that is what I got really, really good at, which was using my physical speed and force to try and instill concussions on another player. That's exactly what I was taught. That has changed dramatically. 
And luckily we have professionals trying to teach young athletes how to do it properly. We have coaching platforms that my friends are all a part of that are trying to teach young athletes how to tackle differently. There's actually rugby, uh, rugby programs that have brought, been brought into the football world to teach young football players how to hit from the side and tackle from the side. And there's so many of these, um, these adjustments that have been made. But like I was talking earlier, is really about football is going to be football. People are going to be getting faster and stronger. And I had to figure out a way to navigate that myself. So uh, long story short, I got pretty good at football. I got a scholarship. I played some college football. And I ended up becoming a professional football player. Uh, after about four years of playing pro football, I got my first concussion. Well, I got my first concussion. And uh, that is in 2011. In 2011, we lost Wade Belak, Rick Rippin, Derek Bugard, and Junior Seau, all professional sportsmen, three NHLers and one guy in the NFL. And I really related to these gentlemen because they were all the enforcers on their team. They were the person on their team that really was trying to inflict fear and pain onto the other players. And so when I was sitting in a dark room in Montreal at the time, I didn't have uh, an income anymore because I had my, my livelihood taken away. Uh, I didn't know if I was gonna be playing sports anymore or if I was gonna be a part of the locker room anymore. I was scared and I had already previously dealt with some significant depression in my past. So put that all into a toxic stew and really what you got was a very unhappy, depressed individual. So fast forward to being a stubborn professional football player, I got back on the football field and I had to prove myself to myself, to my teammates. And uh, the next two years, I was actually voted the nastiest player in the CFL consecutively. So that was actually one of the more pride, prideful moments in my life because that's what I was actually trying to do. Um, but it was for the wrong reasons because I wasn't doing it the right way. And really what took place is I was trying to, again, use my head to, to tell myself, to delude myself into the fact that I could still do the game I could still do it right, and uh, you know, fast forward four more years of playing professional football, and about 30 concussions later, uh, I'm on the football field in Regina. My son is, what, nine months old at the time, Dev? Something like that? And I didn't know where I was. I didn't know why I was wearing the color green, and that's really when I remember I got into the car after the game, and I. And I told my wife, I said, that was the last football game I'm ever going to play. And we were both scared. I didn't know where I was going to be or what I was going to do. And really, uh, that was probably the most frightening moment of my life because I had to support a kid. I had to support a family. And I didn't have an identity or a foundation for who I was as a man. And that was a very scary time for me, for my partner, and uh, that you know, really led to my reason for being here tonight was to tell my story and how, my, how, how concussions have impacted me. I don't get headaches every day. These bright lights are not bothering me. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have all my physical st uh, structure. In if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of a big dude. Uh, you can laugh at that, that's all good. Is uh, what it led to was further depression, further Ill irritability, and really uh, uh, a lack of organization for me that led to, you know, multiple uh, former associates and people that have worked with me really just not wanting to have me around or not to work with me and just leaving because I was so unorganized, I was irritable, but truth be told, the only people I ever raised my voice at were these ones, right? Which is so interesting that for me as a man, I was like, oh, I'm gonna keep, you know, keep it PG in person. You know, everywhere I go, I'm, I'm gonna you know, keep my reputation intact as much as possible. But that's really where I let myself down was, you know, whether it be managing my financial household or you know, just the energy in my household. And that's really where I'm so fortunate now 
is that I was able to take all of that, strip all the stress back, all the little, the intricate details of why concussions were so bad for me is because I never was able to manage my stress, manage my, my, my entire existence because I just felt like I was gonna brute force my way through it. Uh, and then, you know, let's throw a pandemic and running an events company into that whole mix. And uh, yeah, it just kept on getting worse and worse and worse. I got one question. How much time do I have left? Four minutes. Yes. All right. And that leads me to today. I have had some extremely difficult conversations with my associates, with my partner. You know, my wife and I had spent, I'll be PG on this version, has spent some time apart, and we were lucky enough to utilize our resources at our disposal, which were counselors and coaches and fitness advisors to really bring us back to ourselves, bring us back to really what matters for us, which was the energy in the room, the energy at home. And if you, do, if you don't have a coach in your life that, or a, a, a counselor in your life or someone that can guide you through that, you're gonna be lost. And you know, I was lucky to have the perspective of hitting rock bottom over and over and over again to the point where I can stand up here today and say, you know, it is a, there is a strong foundation down there when you, you know, look at all the pieces on the table and, and get to the point where you need to make a change. And, you know, I, I, I didn't put much up here. It says football player, right? But, you know, I've been in the mental health game communicating my story uh, in an effort to share uh, authentic, true experience uh, to, to share with people that you're not alone, you know. I see a couple crutches in here, some sunglasses in here, and there's lots of people that have their own unique experience, no different than mine. You know, for me, like I said earlier, no jokes aside, you know, I look a certain way because I've built this, this physical structure up so that I can deal with the stress that's put on my shoulders that goes through my mind, and, uh, and I'm glad for that because it's enabled me to put my shoes on every morning throughout the pandemic, running you know, a facility, running an events business, trying to run a family, uh, and it was enabling me to deal with all those stressors that, come, that came our way as a, as a community, but also just specifically uh, for me. And you know, I, I'm just extremely grateful for those coaches uh, that, you know, those, those advisors, those friends that really I could lean on in the moments where I didn't know where I was going or what I was gonna be doing next, uh, but they just told me to keep going. And, you know, they all told me to, to pivot and make changes. Uh, it took me four years to make them, but uh, I was able to make them, and I was only able to make them because I was, I was able to really listen to the people that were guiding me in the right direction. And, and one, I have to thank my, wife for being there even when I wasn't able to pick myself up uh, you know my fitness coach uh, who lives in Vancouver and you know our counselors uh, there's people that are doing great work in the community and we really just need to guide all of the people that need our support uh, into those places with as much compassion and empathy as possible because when you're on on the bottom and you don't know where to turn and the world is shut down and you don't have an income but you have friends and community to lean on it's it's a really uh, strengthening place to to know that you you have someone that you can reach out for to pick yourself up so uh you know first of all thank you to those people and and uh yeah just keep going thank you so much Yeah, oh, thanks so much, Shay, for sharing. Um, and uh, I would say, like, um, the the a lot of my job um, is really focused on uh, these stories that uh, you're telling us and uh, trying to help those that uh, are suffering from the effects of concussions.
It will make sense, I promise. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I started working on concussion research about 12 years ago when I started my PhD. And so because concussion is uh, a somewhat invisible injury, unlike a lot, a lot of other types of injuries where if you see somebody with a broken arm or broken leg, um, that's a very obvious injury. But for somebody who sustained a concussion, you might not be able to tell that there's any sort of injury to them. And so a lot of times uh, uh, in the past, uh, these injuries can be maybe sometimes unrecognized or, or, or concussed patients are not given sufficient accommodation that they need. And this invisible nature of the injury is exactly what I started my PhD research on with the guiding question of what exactly happened in the brain if nothing seems to be broken on the outside. Um, because for concussion, usually the idea is that the skull is not broken, um, unlike a lot more severe head injuries and brain injuries. Um, and so if the skull is not broken and the brain is very well protected in this very thick layer of skull, probably the best protected organ in our body, then what exactly is happening to injure the brain? We know that it's a mechanical event. We always can see that there is some sort of uh, force that's uh, causing the concussion. Um, and so we feel that you know, there's a, a mechanical component to the injury cause. But uh, it is still not very well understood how exactly the mechanics works, and uh, that's where my research comes in. So if we, um, if we were to uh, take a look at the US Center for Disease Control website on what their definition of a concussion is, they'll show us this video, uh, which um, we can get it playing. Um, so, this is what they would show on their website, website as to uh, what is happening inside of the head and inside of the skull uh, during an injury. And so you kind of see the brain that's uh, uh, sloshing inside of the head and back and forth and uh, hitting, likely hitting the inside of the skull. And you see the parts that are lighting up. Um, and so that's uh, what uh, we used to think um, what is happening during a concussion. And so as uh, one thing that I want to point your attention to is that the skull, the, the, or the brain, was more or less moving as a rigid uh, body inside of the skull. So it's this object that's in the skull that's moving around and shaking around and hitting the inside of the skull and getting scraped, et cetera. Um, and so I would say that while I wouldn't entirely roll this out as uh, the the potential mechanism of concussion, we have learned a lot more about the soft tissue behavior of the brain. So the brain is very soft. Um, we, it's really hard to look at uh, a, a live human brain, um, but I can tell you that from, from lab testing of brain tissue, uh, fresh brain tissue or brain tissue that's been you know, taken, say, um, out of an uh, animal subject for, for some time, that this is a very soft tissue in our body. And it's got the consistency similar to jello, almost. Um, and so it's not very, very rigid. Um, and so even though the video on the, the left-hand side might be an exaggeration <laughs> of, of what's going on during an actual head impact, uh, the right-hand side video is an actual simulation of a concussion impact and of what the brain might be experiencing during a concussive impact that we measured using sensors that I'll talk about. So as you can see, um, that because of the soft tissue behavior of the brain, it's unlikely that it's going to move as a rigid body inside the skull. And what we think is that there's actually a lot of deformation that's happening within the brain and maybe not as much scraping on the outside of the brain or, or a, a huge lot, a lot of sloshing inside of, the, inside of the skull either because the brain is pretty well cushioned uh, in a fluid layer within the skull. Um, and another thing that's interesting that, that scientists have uh, uh, moved towards thinking more about is uh, uh, linear versus, versus rotational motion. 
Um, so in the past, a lot of regulatory um, uh, standards where how helmets are, are regulated or how protective mechanisms in cars are regulated is through linear acceleration of the head only where we look at how much the head is translating and how much is moving linearly in space in different directions. And we, we try to limit that linear acceleration of the, of the head to a certain amount in order to make um, uh, safety claims about protective equipment. But now with this kind of jello-like behavior, uh, what scientists think is that that linear translation of the head is not actually gonna deform the brain very much. But if you consider putting a ball of jello and rotating that ball of jello, that is actually gonna cause more deformation in the brain because of its non-rigid nature or like very low rigidity. And so this linear rotation is still a debate in my field, um, which leads to the need to gather more experimental data to help us understand these mechanisms. And so a lot of my research has, since my PhD time has been focused on developing sensors uh, like what's shown on the screen here, where we basically put the type of motion sensors that are in everybody's smartphones, maybe with some extended ranges of measurement, into athletic equipment like mouth guards that are worn by athletes. Um, and uh, in sports, uh, contact sports for example, we are able to, uh, we're fortunate to work with a lot of athletes that care about the problem of concussions who are willing to wear these instrumented mouth guard sensors and, and allow us to measure the impacts that are being sustained in an on-field, real-world scenario. So obviously we can't take people into the lab, concuss them, and then figure out what the mechanisms are. But with, with, with wearable sensors, we're able to now actually measure real world injuries. Um, and that's something that's very exciting in recent years where we're scaling up the use of these wearable sensors and measuring injuries that are happening in various sports. Um, and so using that information, we're able to measure the linear accelerations, the rotational accelerations of the head during these uh, concussive as well as subconcussive impacts and try to infer what kind of mechanical forces might cause injury. Um, and aside from concussion, there's also a lot of investigation of how the multiple impacts in sports the numerous impacts in sports might be accumulating over time to cause some sort of longer term effect on the brain, which is also of huge concern in the community. Um, and so with instruments like this, we're able to make the real world measurements of impacts and try to correlate them with the clinical outcomes and maybe come up with some sort of concussion predictor function that will allow us to use these sensors as on field screening um, devices for injury. Um, and then at that point, potentially we wouldn't have to rely on athletes uh, to be under the pressure of having to report their own injuries, but instead we can have these objective sensors to tell the team doctor, okay, maybe this athlete needs to be pulled off for further examination. Um, and so that's my research and uh, we're hoping to learn more about how the different forces in the head and would translate into the brain, how the brain is deforming inside of the skull and how that ultimately leads to brain injury both for the short term and longer term effects. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, Shay, and thank you, Lindia, for setting the stage. I, as uh, Mike mentioned, I'm a neuroscientist, so I'm really gonna focus on what's happening in the brain. But I actually wanna start, thank, oh. <laughs> thank you. I actually want to start by having you think about our own Milky Way galaxies. There are 400 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. I want you to compare that to the number of neurons in our brain, which is 100 billion, just to give you an idea of the scale and the complexity of what we're dealing with. Now, 
The brain, we know in the last 10, 15 years or so, that the brain is incredibly plastic. There are changes that happen all throughout life. We're actually born with the same, with these hundred, most of the hundred million neurons that we need at the time of our birth. But the brain changes with development, it changes with aging, changes with learning, it changes with um, brain injury as well in ways that we are only now starting to uncover. And the reason I bring this up is because for many years, and almost I would say a decade ago, people used to think that a concussion was just a hit to the head, that really nothing was happening to the brain. In the last 10 years with work that Lindia has doing, other people who are doing with neuroimaging, we're really starting to understand that the changes that happen to the brain after getting a hit to the head has quite significant influences both on the structure of the brain in terms of the neurons, but also the function of the brain, how the neurons communicate with each other. This is something that we really didn't understand even a decade ago. And part of this sort of myth around this concussion was that it was transient and that there was really nothing that was long-term. But stories like what we've just heard from Shay when he talks about you know, the long-term effects, the symptoms that he's had over time, and a lot of um, clinical evidence that, show, that was starting to show that there's actually quite a lot of damage that's happening in the brain, but there's also a lot of plasticity. And similar to Shay's story, when I started working in the area of concussion, I met two or three enforcers who were playing ice hockey. And I had a chance to talk to them. And their job, just like Shay said, was to basically cause a concussion to other people as they were playing ice hockey. And something that I will never forget is one of them told me that they got so addicted to actually hitting people over the head on the head, that if they played a game where they didn't get a chance to hit somebody, he would actually go home and hit himself because he felt like he was craving that kind of stimulation. Unfortunately, because of all these injuries, he passed away probably about five years ago. But before he did, he said to me, focus your work on the, the infants, the children, who are going into the field who we really need to understand what's happening in the pediatric brain. And this is where I have focused a lot of my work. So in terms of, um, in terms of function, let's start with this video. This is an animation of a video, and I think it actually looks very much like our galaxy. And this is just showing you how the neurons communicate with each other. We now think of the brain much more as a network, just like the World Wide Web, just like the internet. And you see that all of these, whoops, I guess I only had it for 10 seconds, um, that there's tremendous communication that's happening in the brain. And not just when we're actually thinking or doing something active. When we are in what we call a resting state, when we're actually sitting and not really doing very much, this is when the brain actually uses almost 80% of its energy in, in maintaining the state of being in a rest. And if you think about all that activity that's going on, imagine what happens when you have an injury, especially when you think about how the brain is wobbling inside, uh, inside the skull. There are a lot of changes that we see in the function of the brain. And this is partly because of the way that our brain is, is um, designed to be inside the skull. In the animal world, there are actually examples of birds or animals that actually spend their lives hitting their head. A woodpecker, for instance, spends about 25,000 times a day hitting, their, hitting its head against a tree trunk. But has anyone here seen a concussed woodpecker? No, <laughs> because their brains are actually designed very differently. Their mechanisms to support the brain is actually designed for the act of hitting the, the, uh, the tree trunk, for instance. Human brains are not designed in this way. So one of the things that I've been doing in my lab with my students is to look at 
the pathways, the functional pathways and how the brain actually communicates with different parts of the brain. And we bring people into the lab and we put sensors on their brains, on their heads, on their skull, to record the activity just when they're sitting at rest. So we ask, we put these sensors on the head, we ask them to close their eyes and just sit for five minutes, not doing anything, not thinking about anything in particular. And we bring in kids who um, are healthy, who've never had a concussion, but um, that we know of in, in the last five years or so. And then we bring in kids who've had a concussion from either playing ice hockey or football or soccer. Um, and we look at the differences in how the brain actually is communicating. And what you see here, I just want to point out a couple of things. The arrows are actually showing you in what direction the information is flowing. So this is a, a pattern of information flow within the brain during, again, the state of being in rest, right? So the brain at rest is never at rest. So that's my number one point. But what you see here is if we just look, focus on the red arrows, there is most of the information. So these sensors are in various parts of the brain. The top of the figure shows sensors that are coming from the frontal part of the brain. This is where a lot of your uh, processes related to cognition, for uh, emotion, for processing information, all of that is in the front of your brain. And the parts of your brain are actually communicating with each other are mostly on the left. And what you see on the bottom level is all the, the pathways in the concussed brain. And you see that that has actually shifted. The, the pattern of the flow now is going much more from the top to sort of the middle pathways. So essentially what's happened here is that your brain has actually started to reroute the information. This is a kind of plasticity, right? Your brain, if you think about, to give you an example, if you had, if you look at the worldwide um, airways, the, the plane routes all over the world, let's say you were going from Vancouver to London, to London, England, and there's a certain pathway that the flights always take to get there. If there is, on the way back, let's say there is a, a snowstorm in Vancouver, all what happens, all the flights are rerouted. They are going into a different path to get to the same place. Or sometimes they have to go to a different airport. In the same way, your brain is getting rerouted and taking different pathways to still continue this information. The only thing here is that we think it takes much more energy now to reroute those pathways to go in a different direction and it takes a lot more energy to even maintain the resting state. And so even within the resting state, we can already see that there are changes. Now, the question is, are these changes transient? Are they temporary? Are they, you know, is this something that happens for the rest of your life? Well, there's a lot of questions here that we don't know the answers to. We think that in some people, these pathways always stay within this different rerouted uh, pathways. In other people, it seems to go back to the way it was before they had the concussion. Why would that be in some people and why not in others is still one of the questions that we're trying to figure out. But this study that I did was just with young male um, athletes. What we don't know is what happens in women. One of my students, Jules McCloyd, who's sitting here in the audience today, and you can talk to her after, she's looking at what happens to women who've had a concussion. Do these pathways look similar to what it looks like in boys? Is there an effect of sex on how our brain is actually communicating in before and after a concussion? What, what sort of um, impact does, do hormones have on this? We're still, she's just about to give me the final results, so I can't really share the sort of preliminary results, but I can tell you that there are some differences. There are definitely some sex differences in how the brain responds after a concussion. There are many things about concussion that we don't know. A lot of the work that has been done on concussion has primarily been in white males. Now, you're probably not shocked to hear this because you know that a lot of medicine 
has been going in that direction. The studies done on women has, has also always, is only now actually in the last few years we're starting to see um, a lot of attention being played on women's brain health. And we know that women respond differently and they have different um, changes that are happening in the brain. Another thing that we don't know very much about is what happens in the indigenous population. This is a population that has really not received a lot of health or medical care. And another one of my students who's sitting here in the audience, uh, Mackenzie, is, is going to be looking particularly at the indigenous community to see how do they actually experience concussion? How do they use their traditional methods of understanding brain injury and healthcare, and how can we use that to actually try to understand how they treat concussion, but also how they recover from it, and how can we, um, coming sort of from the outside, try to help them and, and figure out ways that we can understand the, the sort of processes that uh, deal with Western medicine compared to indigenous me medicine, and is there a way to actually put these two things together? So these are some of the questions that I'm working on. So this is the functional changes. I have one minute, great, for my last slide. Um, just to tell you quickly about the structural changes, this is work that shows um, changes in the myelin in the brain. So if you remember from your high school classes, myelin is basically like an uh, insulator. It helps to conduct the impulses in the brain. And one of our professors, um, Professor McKay at UBC, developed with his team a way to actually image the myelin in our brains. And what you see here in the top panel, you see the white, um, the tracks of the brain, and you can see that there's, as you go across, there, so the, the, the one on the left is an 18-year-old male, the, the middle one is a 36-year-old male, and the last one is a 51-year-old male. You see, first of all, that myelin actually increases with age. This is not something that we had expected to see. We always thought of myelin as being a static kind of substance that just helps with insulation and you know, conduction velocity. But we see that it actually does change with age. It increases. So your experience that you have in your lives every day actually influences not only the function, but the structure of the brain. And what happens after you have a a brain injury. So the, the one on the bottom left there is somebody who's had multiple concussions from playing rugby. And you can see, compared to the one on the top, that there's very little myelin in his brain. This was something that's totally unexpected. We didn't think that having a brain injury would really change the amount of myelin in the brain. In the last one, I'll just finish off quickly, um, is a 51-year-old female who was traveling um, in the northern areas of BC in a, at a time when there was a lot of snow, the weather was terrible, the car was going really fast, she got into an accident, had to break, and she actually flew through the windscreen into a truck that was traveling in front of her. And this is what her brain looked like in terms of the myelin. So much of her myelin had actually been stripped away. But this actually, brings me to the very last point about the plasticity, is that we're starting to find, at least in animal models and some in humans, that exercise can actually increase the amount of myelin that's in the brain. So there is some hope for trying to develop new interventions based on some of the studies that, that we're doing in neuroimaging. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. There we go. Thanks, everyone. Um, so you've heard the amazing work that's being, do, being done by my, by my colleagues here. But, and you know that the brain, as you've heard, is an intricate three-pound organ. It's your information highway that allows you to walk, to talk, to see, to hear. And we really need to heed the warnings on immediate recognition of concussions. 
to, in, uh, Naz just spoke about the interconnectivity of the neurons. You've got a billion neurons in the brain with a trillion interconnectivity. And the storage capacity of the brain, of those neurons, is 2.5 petabytes. So that is equivalent to 100 million gigabytes. And if I break that down even further, it's equivalent to your TV running for 24 hours a day for 300 years. That's the capacity of the brain. And we re my work is to really stress the importance of really understanding the importance of this one organ that you can't transplant. It's the or only organ that you cannot transplant. So we want people to really recognize, immediately recognize a concussion and know what to do. So, sorry. So how a concussion is handled in the minutes, hours, and days after injur injury can significantly influence the extent of damage and recovery from this injury. If you sustain a concussion, and you don't recognize it, and you continue to participate in activity, you are now three times more likely to sustain a second concussion, potentially more serious, and prolonging your recovery. And that's what happened. I, I don't know if many of you might have remembered Sidney Crosby being sidelined about a decade ago. That's actually what happened to him. He uh, played in an outdoor winter classic. He took a hit that he didn't recognize himself, his medical team, the athletic trainers, nobody recognized it. He played in a regular NHL season game a couple of days later, took a second hit, and that's what sidelined him for a period of about 10, 10 months. And that's when media and medicine started talking, what is this thing called a concussion? Now, if you don't recognize it the second time and you continue to participate in activity, you are now nine times more likely to sustain significant brain damage and possibly even death. And it's because the, there's the shearing and tearing of the neurons that happens on each impact. And I always give an example of an earthquake. When there's an earthquake, you get fractures in the roads and cars can't progress through that road until that road is repaired. And that's exactly what you're seeing in the brain. You're seeing, seeing the shearing Tearing and tearing, similar to the fractures, where there is a backlog of information. It can't get processed through, and that's what you're seeing in the symptoms and the signs that in individuals are experiencing. Now, we've also had a death uh, back east, Rowan Stringer. Um, she didn't recognize her um, several hits over a series of days playing high school rugby, and she was feeling really off, and it was her third game that she was going to play on Mother's Day. She knew something was wrong. She talked to her friend and she said, I'm, I'm feeling really off. I don't know. Is it a concussion? Do I have the flu? Her friend said, you should tell someone, maybe tell your parents. She said, no, nothing's going to keep me out of the game tomorrow on Mother's Day unless I'm dead. Unfortunately, she took a hit on Mother's Day in that game, the first play of the game, and she never woke up after that. And I had, I had the fortune of having lunch with her friend and her friend said to me, if only I knew. If only I knew about this injury called concussion, how significant, how important it was, I wouldn't have let her play, but now I have to live with that every day of my life knowing that I could have done something. So this is why we want to really ramp up education and awareness amongst all audiences because concussions are everybody's responsibility. The individual themselves knowing how to immediately recognize it, physicians to know how to accurately diagnose it, Parents, individuals, healthcare professionals knowing how to manage a concussion and getting immediate follow-up care if persisting symptoms uh, are, are continuing. As you've heard, the science around concussions has been evolving over the past decade. We've come a long way in understanding the intricate nature of the brain, the connectivity. There has been amazing research being done in blood biomarkers, neuroimaging, uh, et cetera but we have a long way to go. Why do two people respond so differently? You can have a significant head-to-head -head impact, say, heading the ball in soccer, and that individual is fine the next day, versus someone just hitting their head, taking their groceries out of the trunk of the car, who is out on, for months on end with persisting symptoms. Why is that the case? We don't know. Is it a, is it a full a specific point to the brain that gets triggered? Is it genetics? What's happening? I have no doubt we'll get to getting more clarity around the intricate nature of the brain over the next decade, but we certainly have a long way to go. So for example, 
You do not need to lose consciousness to be diagnosed with a concussion. That was the thought about a decade ago, and that really only happens in less than 10% of concussions. You do not need to be in a dark room and not to come out of the dark room until you're symptom free. Again, that was the guidance being given 10 years ago, and now we know that that's not the case. We went from the dark room to saying, okay, don't go into a dark room because that gives rise to social isolation and mental health conditions. So just don't go in a dark room, but don't do anything until you're symptom free. And now we know that's not the case. We want the latest guidance say, you know, it's okay to have a few symptoms. It's okay to push through very slowly as long as you're not severely exacerbating your symptoms. But exercise is really good and rest is actually harming your recovery. That's how the science around this is changing. A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury, but I will argue that the 30% of individuals who have persisting symptoms will tell you my symptoms are not mild. I can't function. My quality of life has changed. I can't go out because the light bothers me. I have constant dizziness, nausea. So we really need to really educate people in, on taking immediate action telling someone, getting a diagnosis, if they feel they have sustained a con concussion, and knowing what to, do, what to do. There's no diagnostic criteria to date to diagnose a concussion. There's, there's no blood test that will say, yes, this individual has a concussion, or no, they don't. Conventional neuroimaging will appear normal, um, a CT scan, an x-ray. Unless there's a bleed to the brain or a skull fracture, Conventional imaging won't show you. We have work that NAS is doing with functional MRI and, and high resolution imaging, diffuse tensor imaging, that will show changes to the brain, but that's not feasible in the emergency department setting because the cost of doing those scans are exorbitant and you can't be done, it, it can't be done currently at that cost. So it's purely based on the symptoms the individual is experiencing, clinical history, and an examination that the physician is doing at the time. So we really are, are, are moving towards trying to get diagnostic criteria, but to date um, that hasn't happened. As I said, no two concussions are alike. And an imp important point is that signs and symptoms can appear subtly and up to several days later. So a lot of times you'll see a collision on the ice, the, the player comes off, the coach asks a few questions, they're fine, they're able to answer, they're put back in. That's not necessarily the right thing to do because it can appear subtly. And we always ask to refrain uh, from putting their back in, back in the game and err on the side of caution just in case. Um, if you suspect that a potential concussion has, a, uh, has occurred. And there's no magic bottle of pills. We, we get asked all the time, what can I give my kids so they can play in provincials next week? Or play in this important game, there's gonna be scouts in the audience. There is no magic bottle of pills. The only treatment is immediate rest, cognitive and physical relative rest, so that doesn't mean not doing anything in the first 48 hours. Do your daily activities, but um, and then slowly progress through uh, in a gradual man manner. So what we did about 10 years ago, I recognized that there was a disconnect in the knowledge that people had around concussion, and I'd get more and more calls in my office, especially after Sidney Crosby saying, where do I go, who do I see? The doctor said he's had his bell rung, the teacher thinks he or she's trying to get out of writing exams, how do I support my kid? So what we did is we conducted an envir environmental scan to say what exists out there to uh, inform and educate individuals. And there wasn't. There was two, two tools out there, and there was a cost attached to it. And our provincial government said, if we want British Columbians to learn about concussions, we're not going to charge them. And secondly, how we treat concussions and manage it should be no different than how they do it nationally or internationally. So build it with a global scale. What we then did is we did focus groups with all these audiences, medical professionals, school professionals, parents, um, individuals, athletes, and we said, if we build a tool, what do you want? So physicians said, we want the most amount of information in the least amount of time. We don't have time to go through a long-winded course. Parents said, give us the most important information we need, because when I go to Dr. Google, I get billions of hits. How do I know what's a blog versus what's evidence-based? We took all this information and we built the concussion awareness training tool. So this tool um, has eight e-learning courses. When we launched it in 2013, it had three, and we've been building it. Uh, and we've been very fortunate that it's being received on an international scale. It's mandated 
uh, in 450 schools in our province for coaches in the school system. It's being taught for fourth year medical uh, students at UBC. It's now mandated in over 40 universities and colleges across the country. And we are working uh, with the Canadian Medical Association and the president, Dr. Kathleen Ross, at their request uh, and government request to make sure that all physicians across the country take the e-learning course. So each of the modules has an e-learning course. It's free, it's evidence-based. We've evaluated all the co courses that show statistical significance for changing knowledge, attitudes, and practices. You get a certificate upon completion, and you get relevant resources that are specific to that audience. Um, so you can go to CAT Online, C-A-T-T -T Online. This is a sneak peek at our third iteration that we'll be launching in two weeks. Um, and it'll, it'll have all the latest updated e-learning courses. Most of the courses are less than an hour, and then how much time you spent looking at the relevant resources uh, then is up to you. The, the courses have been completed over 200,000 times um, internationally. It's being um, utilized by government in Lebanon, Beirut, because when I went out there to do a workshop, unfortunately they had a death of a 10-year-old who took a hit in the playground, it wasn't recognized, and he died several days later. Uh, and we've done workshops, East Africa, South Africa, Japan, uh, and in, coming up in New Zealand as well. So I encourage you to go uh, to the tool when you have a moment and uh, learn on the latest evidence around concussion prevention, recognition, diagnosis, and management. Thank you. Thanks everybody very much. Um, so I'm gonna leave this up here for a sec. So before I get to the next phase of our evening, I wanted to in introduce two people. One is a Worcester Institute board member, Dr. Stephen Milstein, who is sitting here. And he is a registered psychologist uh, in Whistler and he treats concussion um, as one of his really his, his main clinical populations. So if you have questions, if you wanna meet him afterwards, uh, please be, uh, Feel free to do so. The second person I wanted to introduce is Mackenzie, is Mackenzie McLeod, who is in the concussion support group of the Whistler Community Services Society, and she wanted to say a few words. Uh, Mackenzie? Hello. Hi, um, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I'm a registered kinesiologist here in town um, and an educator and advocate for concussion awareness and education. Um, so I help facilitate a concussion support group run out of Whistler Community Services. Um, the group is run two or three times a year. Um, and the aim of the group is to support people who have been dealing with more prolonged symptoms or chronic symptoms of their concussion. Um, help educate them on kind of the latest concussion research. Um, so we bring in practitioners in the Sea to Sky area um, to talk about a specific aspect of concussions. And then again, the support piece, just being in a, a community where you're able to relate, um, share your stories, um, and kind of build that connection with people who know exactly what you're going through as well. Uh, on top of that, we're also launching kind of a newer uh, drop-in session style concussion education um, through Worcester Community Services as well. So this is going to be run on a bi-weekly basis. Um, it's a one-on-one 30-minute -on -one, session uh, with myself who, um, if you have sustained a concussion more recently, you can come in, um, chat with me about what you've been dealing with, and then I'm, the goal is for me to help you navigate kind of next steps, because that's often something that's missed is people kind of sustain a concussion or kind of like, okay, well, what do I do next? So I'm helpful, or I'm here to help you kind of guide next steps and navigate um, your concussion journey. So we have the resources in place in town. Um, so yeah, through Whistler Community Services, that's where you can find uh, more information. Thank you. Are there other uh, local healthcare providers who'd like to introduce themselves? Okay, um, feel free to, to weigh in afterwards in, in question, the questions, of course. So the, the next section, uh, which will be like 10 or 15 minutes or so, will be just some questions that I have that the panelists have given me and um, just to spur some conversation amongst you. So the first one, in fact, is all, I think this is perhaps most relevant for Shay and for, 
for Shalina. Is this, this, the, the CATT, how, um, thank you for, for introducing it to us, but how do you, uh, well, wh who are the professionals you work with to feed all this information to create this, this particular tool? How do you determine what is best practices and where you should be going? How do you integrate information, for example, from NASA's uh, clinical work or from Lindia's uh, biomechanics lab? And then perhaps a corollary, Shay, have you actually been able to use um, systems like this or something that preceded it perhaps? And I was curious about you know, how this is perceived from the, from the patient side. So if, if both of you and sure, take it I away. can start. Yeah. Each module, uh, we uh, form an expert advisory committee uh, for the content, and all our content is evidence based. So we use the there's a uh, international consensus in sport group. It's a consensus meeting that takes place uh, every four years with experts across the country, um, and they it's a and they put guidelines out on the latest evidence around concussion recognition, diagnosis, treatment, and management, as well as other evidence-based resources, <coughs> such, such as position statements that are, are developed, uh, et cetera. So we've used all the latest evidence-based content, and then that forms the content for our e-learning modules, and that script is then reviewed and circulated to the expert, a national expert advisory committee that approves the content, and that feeds into the, uh, the e-learning modules. What was, I, I just want to add that when we built this, um, there is credible evidence-based information out there, so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Where there was cred credible evidence-based information, we just added it to the resource section, and where there were gaps that were identified, we developed resources uh, to supplement that. Uh, and we really highly value feedback that we get. So we got a lot of feedback saying, it's great to have this online, but is there a booklet or something I can keep in my office or on my desk? So we develop packages that has all the relevant information that's necessary for each audiences. And all these resources can be downloaded uh, directly from the site, or you can email the uh, email on the site, and we can email you all the printable resources. Thanks. Yes, Shay? Thank you. Um, firstly, I think, you know, I have to say, uh, leaving football, there weren't a lot of resources out there. And as, as you mentioned, in, you know, 10 years ago, go in a dark room. And uh, I'd ask, I didn't really listen to that, to be honest with you, and probably made it worse at that point in time. I was living in Montreal. Just use your imagination. Um, but really, I was very hopeless. I said, this is such a, uh, a new frontier. There's so much that we don't know. It's the, you know, basically might as well be Mariana's Trench. It's, it's just an abyss. And I'm one, I'm super proud that I'm an alumnus of UBC because there's obviously a lot of great work happening at UBC and there's a lot of great work happening in so many institutions across the world. So I think there's reinstilled hope with resources like this uh, and just generally across the board, uh, the technology and the, the funding and the attention that's going towards, uh, you know, providing hope for people, you know, like myself. So thank you and uh, I look forward to, you know, more resources and more, more developments there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I have a question about more like uh, mechanics of what's going on. So all of you have, have mentioned that there's so much that you, that you don't know about what happens in the brain. And part of it is, of course, because it's so difficult to get in there and figure out where all these 100 trillion or one, uh, interconnections and synapses or what they are all doing. Uh, what's the order, what's the sequencing, what are the, uh, and so forth. But what, what I guess I, I was curious about is that it's not just neurons in the brain. There are also an equal number of glial cells, which are kind of the support cells for the, 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 the neuronal uh, firing. And so they, and there are other cells as well. So what, what is it about a concussion that, it, does it only affect neurons? Does it also uh, affect the other cells? And how, what is known about the, um, about the recovery process from the, from the point of view of, of the neuroanatomy? I can start, but I'm not a neuroscientist, so I, can't, I probably can't talk too, too much about the, the cellular mechanisms 
uh, or the latest findings about, um, let's say, the different types of cells in biochemistry, et cetera. So I'll just talk more on the biomechanics perspective in terms of the structures and the types of materials that are, are involved. Um, so I think historically we have primarily focused on neurons because of its unique structure of having the cell body and these really long um, axons that are connecting various regions of the brain. And so that makes it like a, a rope um, or like this wire that's going across the brain. Some are longer projections, some are shorter projections. And in some ways, that could make this kind of a mechanical structure vulnerable to deformation. Um, so the deformations of the brain is thought to stretch these neurons. Um, and the image or the video that I showed you of the concussion simulation, um, in that concussion, we simulated the maximum stretch in the brain to be about 150% of its original length which is thought to cause some you know, cellular level changes that leads to the dysfunction that we see in the brain down the road. Um, on the other hand, there's less focus on looking at, let's say, the neuronal cell body um, or other types of cells that are much smaller or more circular um, in, in their shape because it's thought that with this shape, yes, they experience some deformations, but maybe they're not as vulnerable to that kind of deformation because of the, the differences in the, in the shapes and the differences in the structures um, that makes the wires um, connecting the different parts of the brain potentially more vulnerable. Um, but I do know that there's a lot more work looking into these other types of cells in the, in the brain, seeing what are their responses post-concussion, especially related, re related to inflammatory response. Um, so I'll pass it on to <laughs> maybe Naz to talk about um, that a little more. Sure. So yes, definitely all, both the structures uh, in terms of the neurons as well as the glial cells, the supporting cells, and the myelin is affected from concussion. What we really don't understand is the process of the concussion, we used to think it was just a static one-time event, that you got a hit in the head and you had some damage and that was the end. We now know that actually the process of concussion because of the inflammation that Lindia talked about, there, these changes continue for many, many weeks after. And there are inflammatory processes that affect other parts of, parts of the brain in different ways. Um, and it affects both um, the structure and the function, but there are areas of the brain that seem to be more vulnerable. So I think one of the issues is that, you know, we tend to think about, as Shalina said, no two concussions are the same. But I think that's partly because we sort of equate the symptoms with what's happening in the brain. When we do the neuroimaging, we find that at a group level, there are actually very similar changes that are happening in very particular areas of the brain. So the frontal areas of the brain, as I mentioned, that has to do with cognition, memory, attention, emotion regulation, that area of the brain is actually more vulnerable than other areas of the brain to a hit on the head. And it doesn't really matter where you get hit, it seems that the prefrontal cortex seems to be most, most vulnerable to this type of injury. And so those areas, people experience the symptoms very differently from each other. I mean, when I, if I was to ask you if you all had a headache, you would probably all describe the, your feeling of a headache very differently. And we have you know, tried to correlate the neuroimaging findings with the symptoms, and we haven't been able to. And I think that's partly because everybody experiences pain and trauma in very different ways. And we should stop trying to correlate the neuroimaging with the symptoms, because we're actually measuring very different things when we look at that. So I think that I went aside from the question <laughs> that you were actually asking into a different area, but hopefully that helps. <laughs> Well, actually, that was answered the third question I had, <laughs> but, but which I will, now, I will now pivot and ask it in a slightly different way. 
So you, Naz, and, and Shay, also you mentioned that you know the, uh, no two concussions are alike. It, it affects different people in different ways. Um, but I, I, I guess I'm, I, I just wanted to, to know what, what, could you expand a bit on what are the different ways that have been seen? We've, we've, you've talked about memory loss, a lack of attention, um, uh, psychological effects, but what, what is sort of like the specter of what people can expect or what they should be looking out for when they have or when they see someone have a suspected concussion? <clears throat> yeah, we were actually talking earlier about, uh, you know how when people have like a knee injury or a wrist injury and they, they have a sixth sense and they can tell you when it's going to rain, right? Does everyone, anyone have one of those, right? I have a broken, I've only had one surgery in my entire life and I know it's going to rain because my wrist hurts. What I also came to realize is that when it's about to snow or when it's about to be uh, some precipitation in the air, that's when I start to get a little bit more depressed my head starts to hurt, and my eyes are actually a little bit more sensitive to the, to the, the overcast light, and, and that's where my vision actually gets affected. And so I just came to this realization probably six months ago, uh, and it just clicked. I was like, yeah, just like everyone else that always tells me, yeah, your knee hurt, my knee's telling me it's gonna rain today, because it's about the inflammation and the, the scar tissue that you know 15,000 professional football plays as there's obviously some some damage going on in there. I have not been scanned or any of that, but I can make an assumption here. Um, but that was really my, my understanding is, is like, that was my experience. Like my experience is, again, I don't get crazy headaches every day, but when it does get, uh, when the barometric pressure, I'm using fancy words because they are, you know? <laughs> and uh, is, is that's really when I notice it the most. And I know that there's other people that have a very different experience with, post-concussion syndrome, which is, you know, constant headaches and light sensitivity and X, Y, and Z. It's, you know, I think there's a, there's a full gamut of, you know, spectrum there. And for me, it's, that's my experience is, is really, I'm the weatherman now, so. So, Shalina, do you have other, uh, do you have other, let's say, symptoms that, that, yeah, that um, you haven't know, been brought up? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms. So uh, headache is the most common symptom um, when someone sustains a concussion, but it's headache, nausea, dizziness, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise. But what we're finding more and more lately is the mental health symptoms that are really um, being escalated. Um, people can't function, they feel confused, they feel um, they can't concentrate, um, they feel sad, irritable, angry. All those are symptoms uh, that can be re <laughs> related to a concussion. But what we're now really highlighting on the initial assessment for a concussion and when making a diagnosis is for, for physicians to also assess for mental health. Uh, and what we're saying is physicians should immediately um, book a follow-up appointment two weeks after the initial diagnosis and to really look for any mental health persisting symptoms because if that if they do find that, then they want to treat it earlier rather than later when it's too late. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, just to yes, add, please. in terms of the pediatric population, it's usually the very first thing that parents say to me when they come into the lab, that this child, my son, my daughter, is just not my son or daughter anymore. Either they're really emotional and they cry all the time over things that they never cried about before, or they get very angry and they were always very laid back and easygoing. So in the pediatric population, I think we've known this for quite a while. And I think it's related to the fact that the area of, your, of the brain, as I said, the prefrontal cortex, which is so vulnerable, is an area that's still developing. We used to think that all of our brain development was done in the first five years. We now know that your brain development is really not complete until you're about 25 years of age, and it continues in different ways after that. But, um, and so I think because of that vulnerability, there's a lot more emotional symptoms that, um, that we see in the pediatric population. Oh, thank you, that's great. Um, yeah, I have one last question for this section. Um, what can manufacturers do <coughs> to improve the equipment to lessen the effects of a, of a head impact and that would cause a concussion? And uh, 
I guess the, the, the corollary is what can therapists and clinicians do, and Shalina, you brought that to attention with the CAT, and then also how can people who are in vulnerable positions, such as uh, sports, people who uh, uh, practice sports where um, impacts can be, uh, may happen, what can they do to lessen the, either the severity of it or the, um, the probability that something will happen? So starting with the manufacturers, perhaps. Sure, I can talk about that. Um, and so that probably relates to things like uh, how to design a safer helmet or concussion-proof helmet. Because of the linear and rotational argument, um, there has been a lot of debate on how effective helmets are actually at um, d uh, preventing concussions. Because all our athletes are still wearing helmets, and they're still getting concussed. So obviously, the helmets are not going all the way in terms of fully preventing concussions yet. And if indeed this rotational force is more important in inducing concussions, then helmets are not preventing the head from rotating. They are mostly attenuating that linear acceleration-based force, um, in which case, you can imagine that potentially helmets that, let's say, tether the head better to the torso and prevent, uh, prevent, prevent rotation of the head may help to reduce some rotation, but at the same time, there are a lot of nuances where potentially you're adding something else to it where you might be increasing the other types of uh, accelerations in the process. So I would say that we, we don't understand enough to pinpoint the exact components of force that would lead to a concussion yet um, to be able to say, okay, we need to design the helmet in this particular specific way in order to fully prevent concussions. So that's why helmet design is mostly still focused on attenuating as much of the energy as possible. Um, and with that, because of the helmet having a certain size constraint, um, so my PhD supervisor always liked to say, if you have a helmet the size of a house, you're never going to get concussed. Um, but obviously, that's not practical. Um, so there are also manufacturers who have started to look at uh, um, airbag type helmets, where you can um, inflate to a much larger volume, uh, maybe right before impact, and to be able to have that larger volume be available to attenuate, attenuate more of the energy. Um, but there are more issues associated, or more challenges, design challenges associated with this kind of design. So I would say we're continuously learning to see what are the parameters important to attenuate. Is it linear? Is it rotational? Is it combination? Is it certain directions of force? Um, but uh, if uh, there's something that manufacturers can be doing, is to maybe work on novel materials that can absorb more of the energy of impact. Um, because if there's zero energy, then the head is not going to be accelerating. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, so to date, uh, building on what Lydia was saying, is that there's no concussion-proof helmet. And there was a legal case with Bauer. They came out with an ice hockey uh, Bauer React helmet uh, many years back. And their tagline was a concussion-proof helmet. Sure enough, um, a, uh, a family, a father sued Bauer because his son got a concussion. And he said, well, I bought this concussion-proof helmet and my son got a concussion and sued Bauer. Uh, so the, that tagline was immediately removed. Um, <laughs> but the father won, won the legal case. So yeah, b you know, based on the mechanics around concussion currently, there's no such thing as a concussion-proof helmet. Maybe I'll just add one quick thing before we move on to the other parts of the question. Um, but I would say it is still very, very important to wear helmets. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the... <laughs> That's, that was not the message I was trying to, to tell, which is, you know, concussions or helmets are useless, don't even bother. That's not the case because helmets are effective at preventing severe head injury involving sc skull fracture. And so they prevent the very, very severe cases that could be a lot more life-threatening. Um, and so I often, I'm, I'm on the UBC campus and university students who are biking around or, you know, taking their stroller around and not wearing a helmet. And I'm just, 
I, I can't really see that without feeling, you know, what's going on here because I actually had an undergraduate research student who sustained a severe traumatic brain injury a few years ago when, um, when he was not wearing a helmet but on a stroller, um, an electric stroller. Um, and so uh, he was basically unconscious for a month um, in the hospital afterwards uh, when he was going to apply for grad school, et cetera. But uh, the, the uh, positive side of this story is that he recovered after that month of uh, being unconscious, and he's now at Stanford University doing his PhD. Um, and so um, that's a really positive uh, side of the story. But uh, I, I almost want to install this robot on campus that's just uh, moving around and trying to, to remind undergraduate students to wear their helmet. So the, the key message is still wear your helmet. Even if you feel like uh, it's a relatively safe activity, it's going to prevent from the a lot more severe outcomes that can occur. OK, on that positive note. <laughs> Um, uh, let's switch to the third part of, of our um, evening. In the next 15 minutes or so, let's uh, have questions from the audience. So there will be a few microphones on in the two aisles. So please uh, direct your questions to one or more of the panelists. Thank you. Uh, Melissa here. Uh, thank you for the knowledge. I'm, I don't have a concussion that I think I don't have a concussion, but uh, I'm here to support my partner as well and some friends that are in the room. Mike, I have a loaded questions, but uh, the one that comes out to mind for me right now is with someone who's been concussed for years, call it 20 years or so, um, there's no medication per se to take. And so shaga mushrooms or um, microdosing has been some of the talk. Is that something that is recognized as not so much prevent uh, not so much healing it, but preventing some of the side effects of concussion? <laughs> I guess no. <laughs> um, so there's no evidence base around microdosing at this point, but who knows where we'll be in 10 years from now. But I just have a question. When you said, um, as someone who's been concussed for 20 years, Post-concussion syndrome. Post-concussion syndrome. Sorry, I should have okay. said it that. Yeah, I'm not okay. familiar with, yeah. Okay. Post-concussion syndrome. So ringing in the ears, constant. So those types of things is what we're trying to figure out how to... And were rig. you diagnosed with a concussion, a mild concussion or a moderate So I have severe? a background very similar to Shea. I played professional hockey okay. back in the 80s when you took smelling salts and got back in there. Right. So I, people ask me how many concussions I've actually received. I always say to them, in what game? Because I know, I have no short-term memory, but I can tell you exactly what happened to me 25 years ago in Technicolor. But I could meet you, live, I, I forget my next door neighbor's name. So, you know, short-term memory is not there but I can go way back and I can tell you things and sport has changed, awesome. Helmets have changed, awesome. People's fists haven't. We play in a very, very rough game. The game's changed as many sports have. And I see, you know, we've got social media everywhere, you know, m mushrooms and chagas and microdosing and all that, and I kind of look at it, as you guys have mentioned, everybody's symptoms are different. And I'm just wondering why I'm, why, why I'm listening today is, I wonder how the effects of these herbal medicines affect different people. Because I've tried them and went, eh, nothing happening. So I just want to know, is there any like clinical evidence, because that's what you guys are dealing with, is there cl clinical evidence for that? I know if I'm dehydrated, my symptoms get worse. So I don't know if there's any clinical evidence to that, but I know if I drink a fair amount of water, or I'm, I'm hydrated, I, I function better as a human being. Nothing that I'm aware of. 
I, I think uh, we're going to go to the next question, but I, I think from my personal experience, that obviously, we, like we, we work out together all the time, so we talk about this all the time. We're always jamming back and forth. But it's about really just the, the stress management, the hydration, sleep, all these like, you know, these really simple things that we can control that aren't that easy to control because life gets in the way. Um, but, you know, with regards to, you know, their doctors, they have to answer a specific way. Do what works for you, right? Do what works like legitimately if like, if going in the woods and grounding yourself with bare feet like connects you to, you know, the spirit, go for it. And if not, then go, go do light therapy or whatever it is that works for you. Thanks, yeah. yeah for sure. Question here on the, uh, on the right? Oh, I, I, uh, oh, I got sorry. a question up here. I yeah, um, so just as a, little, as a little sidebar on, I've, I'm a local provider for that treats concussions, and around the whole psilocybin microdosing, I have just like anecdotal evidence that it can change, it can improve, but I've also had some patients who say, no, it didn't do anything. So, like Shay mentioned, do what works best for you. Um, but my question uh, has to do around helmets, um, I'm sure, or uh, especially around the, the mountain biking world, and I know now I'm more into the snow sports, uh, helmets now have MIPS technology, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, what, what are your thoughts? What are, because it, my understanding is that, in theory, it limits the amount of rotational force that comes into any sort of impact, and especially when it comes to skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, it's very, or it's not very often that you're going to get a very linear impact. So that is supposed to dampen some of that rotational force. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are. I'm going to take that one. Uh, I have, as I alluded to earlier, I have young kids skiing and snowboarding. I know that you all have kids and family members that are doing it, and you're doing it yourselves. I had a big hit a couple, you know, last week, brand new snowboard, never read it before smashed my shoulder chest and shocked my system. I hadn't been hit like that in a long time, but I was wearing a helmet, but I hit my goggles. And I, I just, I think to the point, it's like, there isn't a helmet out there, there isn't a system out there, there isn't a, there isn't a, uh, any sort of structure that you can put on your head, to my knowledge, that is gonna eliminate those things. You know, I, when I <clears throat> finished playing, I was wearing this helmet and it's strapped and tight and it was, tightened around my chin, opposed to kind of just a strap that was tight. And so it kind of came around the back of my head and it really, it felt tight on my head and I liked it and it gave me confidence, but I also got two concussions with it. And so I think really it's, you know, to the Bauer standpoint, not to bash Bauer here by any chance, but uh, is, is like, you know, what works for you, right? And I always, I was gonna say this earlier is, uh, did anyone play Donkey Kong, the, the video game, back in the day? Yeah, a little bit? So they, they had this mode called DK mode, right, where everyone's helmet or everyone's head would get enlarged to, like, mat, like huge heads. And I always felt like that was the only way to prevent concussions is with a massive helmet on top. So we might be on a trend here with those giant baseball caps that everyone's wearing. So I, again, I think I'm just reiterating is like there isn't a perfect example of what works and you know, MIPS or you know, Bauer or what have you, it's like people are trying to sell their products. So you know, just being m mindful of that at all points in time. No different than even service providers and or chagas and or anything. It's like you, know, you can't just take what you see and, and utilize it. It's like what works, you know, use, your, use your own personal experience to, to really gain you know, that knowledge. Do you have a comment to add to that? Um, yeah, maybe I'll just comment a little bit on the MIPS technology in terms of rotation, rotational forces. So I would say that it is a relatively unique kind of helmet design or helmet liner design. Um, so for those in the audience who might not be familiar, the idea is that it can allow your head to slide in the helmet uh, when you're experiencing an impact, as opposed to, you know, traditional helmets, which is just one piece, and uh, you, your head may be moving together with the helmet, um, but instead it allows that uh, motion inside of the helmet. 
Um, and so the idea is that potentially, um, if you think about you know, a car running at a wall, that stopping distance and how fast you're stopping affects how much acceleration there is. Um, and so if you have a longer stopping distance, then potentially the acceleration will be lowered. Um, and so it could be a similar idea there where if you have a longer trajectory where you can dissipate that energy, then potentially that peak energy that you're experiencing is gonna be lowered. That being said, um, I think in principle, there are some things that can work well with this design, um, but at the same time, it's hard to predict where your head is exactly gonna go with, uh, with the material design. Um, and so at the moment, there isn't sufficient evidence to, sh to show that that helmet is gonna prevent concussions. And uh, as the study design that would prove that will probably need to put cohort, two cohorts of athletes, for example, who, uh, where one, one cohort is wearing the MIPS and the other cohort is not wearing the MIPS, um, and show that the concussion rates are reduced with the cohort that's wearing the MIPS. But to my knowledge, there isn't such studies supporting the, the clinical evidence um, that this is indeed reducing concussions. Maybe because of the biomechanical complexities involved um, that will have it, it will help in different ways in different kinds of impacts. And one more thing I'll add is that there's another researcher, Peter Crypton at UBC, who has also been working on helmet design. And one of the things that he um, uh, works on is preventing um, spinal cord injury, which is an, another important type of injury to, to prevent. Um, and then a lot of times, if the head is constrained and if the spinal cord is uh, where the, the spine is directly experiencing a vertical force on it, a compressive force, and that can lead to higher chances of injury. So allowing the head to maybe go somewhere and change the posture and have the spine be reoriented is potentially one way to prevent um, spinal cord injury. Um, so a lot of different factors at play, but it is indeed a novel kind of idea that uh, goes away from traditional helmet design. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Um, so anybody who has to leave, please do so. We won't hold it against you. We will, we'd like to have a few more questions from the audience before we break. So question, the next question is on the right here. Yes. Just wondering if you're somebody who experienced multiple concussions, and, you know, time has passed, you're past the immediate symptoms. You mentioned exercise as one thing as being a positive. What other things do you recommend for someone who's had concussions? to do maybe preventative or help with symptoms or things that are known to help? So starting with aerobic exercises, that, that's the exercise that seems to have the most evidence and then st including strength training as well. So I don't know how much exercise that you're doing, but daily at least half an hour of aerobic and including the strength component to it has been shown to have an effect. We now know that you know some people will experience some symptoms and as Shalina mentioned, there's been a shift in how we understand the symptoms. It's, it's okay to experience a certain amount of symptoms, just not that it's deb deb debilitating. Um, that seems to be the thing that really seems to make a big difference. So we've really moved away from the idea of resting for long periods of time. And prolonged rest actually makes recovery take much longer. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, as a parent of a child and somebody that has actually gone through a traumatic brain injury and still suffers from symptoms like 25 years later, um, my child had a head injury two years ago at school knocked out, and then just most recently in free ride, ended up with another concussion. So my concern is, what is the impact of having multiple concussions, and what as a parent can I do to help him recover and not get injured again? I can start. Um, with the second concussion, um, were the symptoms more severe? Were there more symptoms? Did your child recover uneventfully? Yeah. 
So there's a lot of fear out there with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and the movie Concussion that was put out there that having a concussion will lead to long-term uh, progressive degenerative disease such as CTE, and that's not quite the case. Um, I'll give you an example of my daughter. Uh, she's, she had six concussions. Um, ice hockey, volleyball, just falling off the bunk bed at the Great Wolf Lodge. Um, and, you know, people would say to me, and she plays, played competitive hockey. Um, and it was the sixth concussion that made her stop playing altogether. And people would say to me, how are you allowing her to continue to play knowing what you know and what you do? Well, the four, first four concussions, she had very minimal symptoms. She recovered within a week. Um, you know, before we said t seven to 10 days to recover from a concussion. Now we say within four weeks. Um, and she, she recovered no issues. The fifth concussion, she had more symptoms. It took her a bit longer. Um, so that was my red flag right there that now we need to keep an eye on it. And it was the sixth concussion that in the first 24 hours, if I said to her, what's five times five, it would take her a good 15 seconds to come up with that answer. And she was in grade 12. Um, so that was when we decided to have a conversation to say, okay, there's now been a shift. Let's have a conversation and look at you know, what has been happening, what's been the trajectory. So if your child has recovered uneventfully, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about long-term effects at this point uh, if, they're, if he's, he's not having any continuing persisting issues. Um, and just to continue to wear preventive uh, equipment when participating in sports and doing the things that you can to prevent, uh, prevent further concussions. Yeah. I think that the, just quickened, is the the mindset towards the the fear around you know everyone becoming that gentleman in the movie if you haven't seen it you should probably watch it uh that was in my mind also heavily driven by lifestyle after the fact right drugs and alcohol lack of sleep stress da, 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 right and uh and so i mean having lived experience in that same capacity you know removing those obstacles has dramatically changed my outlook and, you know, wearing a helmet when I'm, anytime I do anything, pretty much. And uh, just having the confidence to know that, hey, I could get hurt if I'm walking down the street or, you know, driving my car or what have you. And I, and I don't want to live in that fear because, again, there's anxiety that comes with that and everything. So just like, I, I remember we were at uh, Joyride and my son saw some dude do a backflip, triple back, whatever, and land it, and the crowd go wild, and he's like, Dad, I want to do that. And I was like, oh, football practice is next week. Let's go. Because, I mean, I don't know. I, what, A and B doesn't really make a difference. They're going to go live their life and do their thing, and especially when they're 12, 14, 12 15, 16, 17. So got to live, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, question here. Could you speak to the services that places like Advanced Concussion Clinic in the city or Canadian Brain Performance Centers offer? Yesterday I was at the UBC Adult Concussion Clinic at GF Strong, and every possible way of helping my concussion that I had been, um, that had been suggested to me that I presented to them, uh, whether it's lion's mane or craniosacral or anything, Every answer was, there's no statistical evidence that that helps. And I kind of felt coming out of there that I'm just supposed to wait, you know, and, and ride the trainer and do some minor strength training. Like, but then there are these places in the city that charge you tons of money to do all these things. And if they don't work, how is that possible? Basically, what do I do with all those options? And what can I do? Because I will do anything. Yeah, I, I'm, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. So unfortunately in BC, we don't have a publicly funded concussion clinic other than GF Strong. And GF Strong, they do deal with uh, minor concussions, but also moderate and severe uh, traumatic brain injuries. We've been working really hard to establish a provincially funded concussion clinic, but we're still a ways of doing that. We have a lot of... Um, unaccredited concussion, private concussion clinics that have opened up in our province, charging exorbitant amounts of money that's so needless and unnecessary. I had one family say to me, it's cheaper for me to fly to 
the Winnipeg Pan Am Concussion Clinic, my colleague's concussion clinic, and get treated there than pay, I won't name any names, but some of these concussion clinics. Uh, and that's just the state of our healthcare system here, unfortunately. Um, so if you do go to a private clinic, make sure they're accredited, make sure they're use, using interdisciplinary care, that there's multiple healthcare professionals, uh, make sure they're using evidence-based treatment um, options um, as opposed to one modality. Um, there, you know, on the, on the CAT website, there is a resource on what to look for if you are going to a uh, privately uh, funded concussion clinic, but I would say be very weary of those in our province right now. Yeah. Okay, it's I think, okay, thank you. Um, I think we'd, we'd like to close the, uh, the formal portion of the, uh, of the um, evening right now. It's already, you know, 10 minutes, more than 10 minutes past. Um, if you have further comments, I think uh, the, the panelists will still be here afterwards for a little while. Um, I do want to close the, um, the, the session here with just a few comments. Uh, first, that the Whistler Healthcare Foundation, well, this is the, sorry, thanking our, our sponsors. So the Whistler Healthcare Foundation, whose vision is to assist Whistler in becoming a role model for physical and mental health care in our resort community. This is an organization that has taken a true leadership role for our community in tack tackling mission critical challenges we all face. So thank you very much. Vail Resorts Epic Promise, whose stated purpose is to help their mountain resort communities thrive by partnering with critical organizations to make an impact, <laughs> pun not intended. We thank you. Um, and then the, Hil the Hilton Whistler Resort and Spa. We're so appreciative of, of each organization's tremendous support in making these types of focused conversations accessible to the Whistler community. So um, this is the last event of the Global Perspectives uh, speaker series of the, uh, of the Whistler Institute. And for, this is for the 2023-2024 season. It's the, typically the ski season. And looking ahead, our 2024-25 season will start in um, September. So stay tuned for new events and new topics. Also, I want to add a word on Whistler Institute's educational program. Beginning on May 2nd, we are partnering with BCIT to offer a course called Managing Employee Performance and Conflict. This six-week accreditation, accredited course will teach students how to increase employee engagement and optimize productivity by applying performance and conflict management strategies. Um, and you can go to the Whistler Institute website for more information. Um, please sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already, and it just uh, lets you know which what events are upcoming and also what courses are going to be offered. And lastly, please keep in touch with us. We're a growing organization. And we're here to serve you, the community. Um, we really value your feedback and including suggestions for future topics and events. And to that point, uh, our executive director, Mandy, will be sending out a feedback questionnaire in the next day or so. So thank you so much for coming and please have a great rest of your evening.